my name is Reggie Jr. I'm 25 years old. I've been saved for six years and uh, graduate of the West Coast, Best Coast UTC, Brother James. Did you hear that? Graduate of the product of the West Coast UTC, graduate of Lincoln Christian University, graduated my bachelor's in Christian ministry last year. I've been in the church for nine years. Been here since I was 16. My dad came to the home in September of 2009. So we've been c- coming here for a minute, amen? And I'm just, I'm grateful. Really grateful this evening for my salvation. For my wife, amen? She she puts up with me. I'm a knucklehead. She throws something at me, I throw it back, and then she throws it right back at me. Ask the house. Ask Adelina, Pastor Christian. She She's kind of fierce, amen? But I'm kind of like mellow and... I'm not going to argue with her. I'm going to let her win. Amen. I'm grateful for my wife. But I'm really grateful for my pastors. Because they're with me there at my highs when I, when I graduated college last year. They flew out to Chicago. And they were there with me. And they were with me at my lows. When me and my wife were in the hospital. And the do- doctors came and got us. And they told us that our baby didn't make it. And I remember me and my wife were there, and we're, cur- we're curled up, and, and we're, we're hurt, and we're, we're sobbing. And I remember we didn't, we didn't make any phone calls. We just told them, and next thing you know, Pastor Christian and Sister Irene come in, Pastor Benny and Sister Evelyn come in the room. And I'm so grateful for our, for our pastors, amen? Pastor Benny and, and Sister Evelyn and Pastor Christian and, and Irene, and, and they've been here. They've, they've been faithful, amen? They've been toiling, and, and Pastor Benny's been here for longer than I've been alive. And I'm so, I'm so grateful for, for our pastors and, and, and their investment. And, man, if they, if they spend time with you and they take time out of their day to, to call you, and, and look how many of us there are. They, they have a lot on their plate, amen. They have a lot in their hands. And so don't take the time that they give you. Don't take it for granted because it can, it can go elsewhere. It can go into, into preaching in, in high schools. It can go into preaching somewhere else. But when they take the time out of their day to, to text you and to call you and, and they're bugging you about the home and they're asking you how you're doing and they're wondering where you're at and why you're not coming to church, and don't take it for granted, amen? So we can open our Bibles. We're going to turn to Acts chapter 1. And my dad's not here. He's he's handling business for for work. So I'm grateful for for my dad and for Hershey. And I got my my support right here in the, in the second row. Got my cheerleaders. Amen. If you if you if you did sports, you know that you need your corner. You know that you need that that sideline. You need somebody in your corner that's gonna root you on. Amen. So I I ran track. And so if you know anything about track, like that last hundred meters after you already ran your race, you're dead. Like, you're done, you don't want to run anymore, but that 100 meters is right by the sidelines, is right by the bleachers, and most of the time I had my family there, and they're, they're cheering me on. It's just, just enough boost to get you across the finish line, amen? So we need to be grateful for our family, for our friends, for those who are cheering us on, amen? Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says, verse 6 to 8, it says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to him, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power. Somebody say power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, we come before you tonight, God, and we pray that you bless your word, God. That you just use me as your mouthpiece, as your vessel, as your instrument, God. Lord, we pray that that you would just use my life, God, that I would decrease, that you would increase here tonight, Lord. Lord, that you would continue to do the work that you're already doing, that's already taking place, God. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have your seats here tonight. So right here in the book of Acts, Jesus is telling the disciples, who are now the apostles, to not worry about the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't worry about these things. These things are going to come to pass. These things are going to take care of themselves. Don't, don't worry about getting a car. Don't worry about trying to get a job. Don't worry about trying to get a rib. Uh-oh. That was for somebody. It says, in other words, Jesus says, don't worry about these things. These things are going to happen. They're going to come to pass. But what I'm concerned about is the souls of those that are lost. 
These things are going to happen, but what I'm concerned about and what I'm worried about is these souls, the souls that are dying, the souls that are, that are being lost, and, and they're not hearing the word of God. Those things are going to come. But I need you to know that there's this power that you're gonna that you're gonna get when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's this certain power, this certain anointing that you're gonna get when when the Spirit just comes upon you, amen. And it says it's gonna make you witnesses. Now the Bible doesn't say when the Holy Spirit comes upon us that we're gonna just sit in church and do nothing. It doesn't say that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us that we're barely gonna have enough strength to come through on a Wednesday night. It doesn't say that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us that we're just going to be hanging in there, that we're, gonna, we're barely going to get by, that we're just going to make it. But no, the, the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us that there's going to be power, amen? amen. You've been hang, hanging in there for a little bit too long. It's time for you to know that you're more than a conqueror. You're more than an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, amen? Greater is he that lives in me than he that's in the world. You need to know that your God is bigger than your situation, some of you have been telling, telling God how big your problem is, but you need to look at your problem and tell your problem how big your God is. And say, my God is bigger than my finances. My God is bigger than these bills that I got. My God is bigger than, than this audit, this, this IRS that's trying to hit me up. My God is bigger, amen? But we need to know what to do with what God gave and what, what he wants to give us. The Bible says that we're going to receive the power to be witnesses. The endowment with the, with the Spirit is the prelude, which means it's before the equipping for the mission. So first it's the Holy Spirit, then it's the power, then it's the mission. The word witness is, is used 29 times in the book of Acts. So that right there tells you what the book of Acts is about, amen? A witness is somebody who tells what he has seen and heard. When you're on the witness stand in a court, the judge is not interested in your ideas or your opinions, but he wants to know what you experience. He wants to know what you know. Because you was there, amen? The role of the apostles is that of a witness. Witness also means martyrs. But a martyr in this sense is someone who, who bore testimony up until their death, which means that, that was their story, that was their word. It didn't matter what you said, it didn't matter what you told them, but they know that they were there, they know that they were with Jesus, they, they touched Jesus, they spent time with Jesus, and you can't tell them different. I remember when I was 10 years old and I was living with my dad and I had this purple Game Boy Advance. And we went to the store, I was with my aunt, I was like, with your mama. I went, to the, I went to the store, and I got some candy. And so to pay for the candy, I put my Game Boy down on the little candy rack. And so I get my money out of my pocket. I pay for my candy, and then we walk out. And I left my Game Boy there. Oh, man, I was distraught. <laughs> so I left my Game Boy, and I didn't even realize it until we're, like, halfway home. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I left my Game Boy. And so I tried to play it off. I tried to play it cool. And then, like, a few days later, my dad asked me, he's like, where's the Game Boy I just got you? Now, you know that's one of the questions that, that they already know the answer to, amen? So he's asking me, he said, where'd your Game Boy go? And I was like, oh, it's, it's upstairs. I think it's in my closet. I'm, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go look for it right now. So I go upstairs, and I'm, like, looking for it like it's actually there. I'm, like, throwing clothes and everything, and I'm tearing the whole room upside down just trying to look for this Game Boy. But that was, that was my word, and I was sticking to it. I wasn't going to change it. I was going to take it to the grave. I wasn't about to get no whooping, Amen. And that's the same thing with these apostles. It didn't matter what, what persecution came their way. It didn't matter what, what they went through. But they knew that they had been with Jesus. And there was nothing that was going to make them turn away there from their faith. Amen? Amen? These apostles were commissioned to bear witness of what Jesus had done all the way up until their deaths. They had to be more than just preachers who proclaim on what they were taught to proclaim. They're called to be witnesses in the sense of 1 John 1.1. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Men who, who have themselves seen, heard, touched, experienced, and qualified, and, and they become called to testify about Jesus. These were unlearned, uneducated, unqualified, ordinary men. But they had been with Jesus. They didn't have all these degrees piled up. 
It didn't matter if they had a GED or a PhD, but they had been with Jesus, amen? It says that these were uneducated, unlearned, ordinary men. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little ordinary. Sometimes weird, but I think I'm ordinary, amen? But they had been with Jesus, and they were able to be witnesses, and they were able to testify about their experience. Now, when I was nine years old, I used to do Taekwondo, and I used to think I was Bruce Lee. I couldn't do no backflips. But I went to this, this tournament. It was in Minnesota. So I guess I was kind of good. I skipped from like a white belt to a green belt. So it goes white, yellow, green, but I skipped yellow, so I went to green. <laughs> so I had this tournament in Minnesota, and I remember I was staying at the hotel, and uh, I wanted to go down to go swim. So I told my dad, I'm going to go down swimming. So I'm by myself at the pool. And so I get to the ledge of the pool, and I'm in the deep end. I start doing backflips. I did like 10 backflips, just like back to back to back. And I'm, I'm tired. I'm ready to go back up to the room. And this guy asked me to do one more. I'm like, all right, I just, I just did 10, but I could do one more. So I get out, and I'm standing on, on like, like the edge of the pool. And I, I do the backflip, but I don't go in the water. So I just like, I go up, and I come down. And I hit my head so hard that I had this goose egg. I had a, I had a knot on my forehead, and, and I went up back up to my dad. He's like, boy, what happened to you? I was like, I tried to do a backflip, but I didn't make it this time. But I had this goose egg, I had this knot on my forehead, and it's because I hit my head so hard that it left a mark. You, you ever been hit, you ever, you ever just been like sucker punched and you, the wind's knocked out of you, or you just get hit in the eye and you have, you have a black eye, but you get hit so hard that it left a mark. But that's the same thing that the gospel does. When the gospel comes in and, and the power of God comes in, it can hit you so hard that it leaves a mark. But if it don't leave a mark, that means it didn't hit you hard enough. When the power of God hits us, it leaves a mark, and you might try to hide it, but you won't be able to. You've been marked by God, and the Bible says in Ephesians that you're also included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, you, you believed and you were marked with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us, we've been marked. You're sealed, and you're marked by God, and you're authentic. You're not a counterfeit, amen? Amen. You stand out from the rest. You might try to fit in with everybody else, but you're going to stand out. Even at work, I'm in, I still work for Amazon, amen, for until Jesus come back, I'm going to be there. He's paying my bills, amen. But I just got another promotion into, uh, so I'm the staffing coordinator, and I have these events, these hiring events, and I'm giving the presentation, I'm telling them how to do the drug test and everything, and telling them about the job, and I have to catch myself because sometimes I want to say amen, or, some, or sometimes I, I want to say, can I, can I get a hallelujah? But it's like these, these things are already inside of me and these things start to come out because I've been hit, I've been marked, I've been sealed by God. And, and you might be in those situations. It's like when Pastor Benny talks about when you're at, the, you're at a house party or you were somewhere where you're not supposed to be and someone says, can you pass another beer? And you say, amen. <laughs> but those, those things are inside of us and, and it comes out because Jesus left his mark on your life, amen. Once we've had that experience, you can't help but to tell people. But what we say about certain things can determine or change somebody's perspective around us. Just like the Bible says, there's power of life and death in the tongue. Amen. It's like when you talk bad about the church to your friends and your family, but, but you want them to get saved. So you're saying the leaders did this and the leaders did that, but you want to bring them to church and they're going to be like, why would I want to go to church with you when you just complained? You just left all your baggage at my doorstep. You're, you're kicking them out of the church before they even get to the doors. So why would they want to come to a church that they think is, is so horrible all because of what you're saying about it? You already made them leave, amen? But everything is by your experience. It's by witnessing. Now, I've never seen a barbershop commercial. I don't know if it's just me, but when I turn on the TV, I don't think I've ever seen a commercial for a barbershop. But yeah, these, these barbershops are getting filled up, amen? But how are, how are they getting filled up? And it's, it's by word of mouth. Now, I, I've never seen a commercial for a church on TV either, but they're getting filled up, they're getting packed out, and that's also because of word of mouth, amen? But how does, how does this conversation start when, when you want to go to a new barber and you, you come up to, to your homeboy, you come up to your brother, be like, man, that's a, that's a fresh cut, I like the way they got that line up right there, and oh, where'd you get your hair cut at? Oh, it's over down the street, over at Headliners, it's over, right? Or for the, or for the women, ooh, girl, where you get your nails done? Is that, is that acrylic? Is that acrylic or is that gel? See, I, I've been married for just a year, but I'm catching on, babe. 
But we can, we can witness and we can, we can evangelize these things, right, because they left an impact on us. When I get a fresh cut, I'm going to tell everybody about my barber. Pastor Christian been there, a couple of you from the church been there. When you get your, Jack's been there, Jack's been going there since before I was going there. But when you have this experience and it leaves a good mark on you, you want to tell everybody. Like, yo, I just went to this bomb taco spot. Like, you like Roberto's and, and you like taco y taco, but I like tacos el gordo. Amen. With a pastor and a little bit of little piña on it. But the, these things, when, when you want to tell everybody else, it, it just comes out of you. You're passionate about it. We can be passionate about food, amen. We can tell somebody about some wings. I can tell you about, about these greens and, and this mac and cheese and this pineapple nut cake that my grandma make. But, but it's all just talk, right? But the Bible says you have to taste and see that the Lord is good. I could, I could talk your ear off, but you're not going to know how good it is until you try it. And it's the same thing with the things of God. We can go out and evangelize and minister and, and bring people in, but they're just going to know how good God's been in our lives. But until they come here, then they won't know what God's able to do for them. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. There was something about their appearance that grabbed the attention of someone else. When you see that, that other woman's nails, when you see that your homeboy's haircut, it's something about that appearance. You're like, man, how'd, how'd you get that? Where'd you get that at? And we come into the things of God and we got this glow about us, amen? You got a little pep in your step now. You, you, ain't, you ain't limping no more. You, you walking right because God, God healed you. God healed your knee. God healed your back. And you're able to walk a little bit straighter. And they're like, weren't you, weren't you limping the other week? Like, yeah, that was me. But see, what had happened was I came into the house of God and the power of God fell. And, and Jesus changed my life and he touched my back. And I ain't got to take this, these pills no more. I don't have to be hooked on these things no more. Because Jesus touched my life. When our outward starts to resemble our inward, it can open up the conversations to minister and share the experience that we had with God. Hey, I noticed that you don't smoke no more. Oh, yeah, that's because I started going to Victory Outreach and the power of God changed my life. Delivered me from smoking, from gambling, from this, that, and the other. I noticed that you've been, you've been smiling a little bit more. I know that you were kind of complex because you ain't got that many teeth, but now you're smiling. You got, you got three teeth, but you you smiling because you got the joy of the Lord. Amen? And, that's, and they, they say, did you meet someone? Are, are you smiling because you met someone? Yeah, I met someone. His, what, what's his name? His name is Jesus. And he has a plan. He has a purpose for my life. And he turned my whole situation around. Yeah, I met someone. But I have two reasons of why I think people don't witness or evangelize. The first reason is that they never had that experience to speak on. You can't speak on something that you ain't been through. Joshua 9 says, they answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of your Lord God. We have heard the reports of them. All that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan. Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And it says that they heard these things. We heard it from a, from a distant land. We, we heard these things. We heard what, what your God did. We heard of the plagues that, that came upon Pharaoh. We heard that, that, you, were, that you came out of Egypt. We heard that, that you were in this situation, that you were in slavery, that, that you were bound by these things, but we heard that God got you out. So here he is. They were informed of how God had worked on Israel's behalf. They were aware of not only the plagues that took place, but also their escape out of captivity. And just like the Gibeonites heard of what God had did, some of you came because you heard of what God was doing in this church, of what God was doing in, in Victory Outreach. Some of you heard that some of us were getting promotions, that, that finances were coming, that, that Sister Mona found some money on the ground and paid off her whole registration. Come on now. You, you, you heard a little something, and you were like, I want in. I, w I want a little bit of that. I want what they got over there. I want the same thing. Or maybe you heard about what God is doing in our victory homes, amen? That people are getting delivered from drugs, that marriages are being restored, that, that people are getting their children back, Amen? You might have heard what was going on. And you might be here because you heard about what was taking place, but you've never had your own experience. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. And I believe that you might have come 
You might have came in hearing, but you're going to leave telling. You came in because you heard something, but you're going to leave telling everybody else about what Jesus did in your life tonight. We're going to have the worship team come up. And my second point is not only do we need to have our own experience, but I, I think that people don't witness and people don't evangelize anymore because they forgot. They forgot about, about their experience with God. They forgot about what they were saved from. They forgot that every single one of us had a one-way ticket straight to hell, but Jesus came and interrupted our lives. Yeah. Luke 17 says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had, who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them. Somebody say one of them. When he saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a, in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet. And he thanked him. And, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, we're not all ten healed. Where are the nine? He said, he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. All ten ran out to meet Jesus because they were in the same condition. They were outcasts and nobody wanted to be around them, but where are the nine? Nobody wanted to touch them. The, the lepers, they had to come out and they had to say, unclean, unclean. And people had to keep a distance from them. So they didn't have any, any, any contact with anybody. But these, these nine, they, they, they knew that Jesus could set them free. They knew that Jesus was able to turn their situation around. All ten came up to Jesus. But only one came back to thank him. And I think sometimes we can get like that in the church. We're, when, when, we're, when we're down and out, boy, we know, we know who to go to. We know who to turn to. For, for those that are, that are parents and, and your child may not be doing that good. They, they may not be in the church, but they know that you're in the church. Wherever they're at. When they're, when they're down and out and... And the lights go off. And that siren goes off. And they want to they make a phone call. And they call you. And they say, Mom, Dad, can you pray for me? When we're down and out and, and there's things in our life that are out of our control and, and we don't know how to fix our situation, we know where to go. We know who to turn to. We know to turn to that, that praying grandma. We know how to turn to that, that praying mom, that praying dad. We know how to get on our knees and say, God, if, if you get me out of this situation, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And then God gets you out of that situation, and you're like, okay, cool, thanks, God. And we, and we, come, to, we come to God, and we know that he can change our situation. And, and sometimes he's our last resort instead of our lifeline. Don't let Jesus, don't let God be your last resort. Don't forget what Jesus saved you from. Don't forget what he did in your life. Don't forget that you were once a leper too. Ain't nobody want nothing to do with you. Now you done got cleaned up. You got holy, saved, sanctified. You're in your right mind. Your breath don't stink as bad and people want to talk to you now. And you're wearing a suit. You're wearing a tie. You're wearing a dress. You look nice. You're coming to church. People want to be around you. But now you don't even want to give the time to the day, the time of day to those that gave you all their time. The ones who helped you to get, get you where you're at today. Now you're too dignified. Now you're, now you're too holy. Don't forget that you were once in, in that place. Don't forget where you were at. Remember what it was like when you first got saved and, and you felt like a brand new person? And you're like, man, I, I have purpose. I got a reason to get up. I have something to look forward to. I have, I have a reason to live. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says about me, but I know that God's called me. I remember when I was about to go to the training center. And God saved me in July, and I went to the training center in September. So that's, that's two months. And it's about 3000 to 5000 to go to the training center. I had zero dollars, zero thousand, $0, amen. There ain't no way I was getting no two, three thousand, but I knew that God had called me, and I was about to start my sophomore year at UNLV, and I canceled it. I canceled, dropped my classes, dropped out of school, and at the time I was still living with my grandparents, and I already knew that that they were gonna kick me out. So the school year was was supposed to start. The school year was around the corner, and they're like, "Why are you still here? Why you ain't go to school yet?" 
I'm like, oh, the, the year is starting a little bit later this year. It's a leap year, so it's starting a little, a week later. And I remember that it didn't matter what happened. It didn't matter that I, that I got kicked out. And, and I remember uh, I, was, I was telling Taya that I ain't have nowhere to go, that they were going to kick me out. And she was just, she said, just, just ask one of, the, one of the guys to come get you. And I remember one of, one of the, the gang, one of the youth workers came and he picked me up and I had my bags packed. And when I told my, my grandparents, they, they did kick me out. I knew they were going to kick me out. But they, it didn't matter because Jesus had did something in my life. And I remember, I remember that, that feeling of knowing that I was called, knowing that, that God had gave me purpose. And it was like from one day to the next. So tonight we need, we need to remember what Jesus saved us from. And, and I love to look at that Pastor Benny when he comes up here and, and everything is so fresh. When he, when he tells his stories about everything that he's, that he's been through and that he's gone through, and he says, I've been shot, stabbed, ran over, and overdosed at Lisa. And it's, and it's so fresh, and, and he's, he's, still, he's still broken. And he's still broken as if it happened yesterday. And that's the same way that, that we need to be. And we can get a little rusty evangelizing. When crusades come around the corner, you try to pass out a flyer, and all you do is say what's on the flyer. You don't share your testimony because you forgot. There's, you don't have nothing else to say. You share what's on the flyer. Hey, please come to our backpack drive. It's going to be over here. We got backpacks, haircuts. We have food. And they're like, what's it about? Oh, I go to Victory Outreach. Okay. And that's it. But you don't say that I came in a drug addict. I came in here on, on my knees. I came here as a, as a last resort needing hope. I, I came into the men's home and, and Jesus Christ changed my life. You, you don't say that because you forgot. And we can't forget what God's done in our life, amen? We're going to go ahead and stand here this evening. And sometimes it could be, it could be hard to remember. Maybe you've been saved for five years, for ten years, and you're working, you're doing ministry, and you're just doing life. You're letting life pass you by. And even, I remember, I'd be, I try to sit down, and, and even when I prepare messages and I get ready to minister at the home or minister for the gang, and I'm trying to think of, of stories. Like, I know, I know the story's there, but sometimes you just have to, you just have to sit and be still and, and let all the remembrance come back. But sometimes we can get so caught up in, in just doing ministry and doing ministry that we don't take the time to, to just be still. To just be still in the presence of God and, and let all these emotions and, and all these memories flood back in of, of where we were and, and where we used to be. In the, mud, in the mud that we were in. However you came in. Sometimes we need to just be still and ask God to help us to remember, Lord, don't, don't let me forget of what you brought me from. Don't let me forget of, of what you did in my life. And we're so quick to go to the next thing. Just like when you're growing up, you can't, wait to be, you can't wait to be a year older. When you're in junior high, you can't wait to be 13. You hit 13, you can't wait till you're 15 to get your permit. Then once you're 15, you can't wait to be 16 to get your license. Then you want to be 18 because then you're going to order some stuff off a of TV. Because you know them things, the little foot massages and everything, say so you got to be 18 years old to call. Then you can't, wait, you can't wait to be 18. And then when you're in the world, you can't wait to be 21 because you're trying to go hit the tables, you're trying to drink. And, but it's always the next thing. We're, we're never just, just still. We can't, it's hard for us just to be still. I know it's not just me, amen? And sometimes it's hard just, just to be still in the presence of God and, and let God speak to us. And we, we want to give him this list of things. We want to tell him all these things that, that we want him to do. And then he comes out and he gives us his list of what he wants us to do. And we turn it back and we're like, uh-uh. Like when you have a kid and you don't want them to touch nothing, uh-uh. And God has this list and he wants us, he wants us, to put our faith into action, amen? Just like Pastor Christian was talking about on Sunday, that faith without works is dead. We don't, we don't do these things to get saved. We do these things because we are saved. But this evening, you might not even know if you're saved. You might, you might just be coming here with your sister, with your brother, with your, with your cousin, and you don't know if you're saved. You might have been coming here for a while, but well, what does it mean to be saved? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And then once you're saved and this Holy Spirit comes upon you and then there's power. And your, your speech change, changes. 
and you start to walk a little bit different, and the people that you hang out or hang around, they start to change because you don't, you don't want to deal with negativity anymore. Well, there's this joy unspeakable that, that comes upon your life when you know that you're saved and, and you've been redeemed and you've been bought with a price and you, you know that you're supposed to be in hell, but Jesus paid that price for you. And you know that you're saved because there's, there's this brokenness, there's, there's a gratitude. So I'm going to go ahead and make an altar call and, and maybe you don't know if you're saved or if you're not sure, then you can come up also. But it, for those of you who who want to be saved, who want to accept Jesus Christ into their heart and into their lives. And, and you say, Brother Ray J, I heard what you were saying, and, and I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to, I want to experience the God that you've experienced. I want my, my parents to stop fighting. I want my, my family members to stop smoking. I, I want to experience that, that same resurrection power that you experience. So if that's you here this evening, I'm going to make the first altar call. And you say, I want to receive salvation. I want, I want Jesus Christ to change my life. If that's you, you can go ahead and make your, make your way forward up to the altar. And then we're going to say a simple prayer for you. And I